Good evening, everyone. And on behalf of the American Center in Moscow, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today on this last Monday of the summer. My name is Amira Tulhanova, and I'm a literary enthusiast from Moscow, Russia, who studied literature in Lincoln, Nebraska. Today, I'm delighted to host the reading by a wonderful poet, Jeffrey Nutter. Jeffrey Nutter is an author of several books of poems, including Christopher Sunset, The Rose of January, The Giant Moth, and Giant Moth Perry. He teaches poetry at New York University and Queens College. He runs the Walls and Glass Poetry Seminars, a series of private writing sessions. He lives in New York City. Tonight, Jeffrey is going to read his poems to us for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll get a chance uh, to ask some questions. You can drop your questions in the chat, and I'll be happy to pose them to Jeffrey after the reading. And our team at AMC uh, posted on social media the link to the poems that we'll be read tonight, accompanied by their side-by-side -side Russian translations, so you can read them along. And Jeffrey, welcome to Meet the Poet. Samira, thank you so much um, for that introduction, and thank you all for being here, uh, coming to listen to me read. And uh, okay, I'll start. This is the portrait of my father, the soldier, the one-time vendor of cabbage nets, one-time carpenter, gardener, repairer of pistons, erstwhile angler twisting wire and feather into lures with pliers, one-time plasterer, amateur surveyor, one-time dealer of dogs, mariner, supposed pilot of amphibious vehicles, clockmaker, look into his eyes. Shy gray eyes like the osprey or the plover, shy eyes that seemed ashamed of the weapon he carried. It was something to be utilized, one more among the tools of tradesmen, one more conveyor of heat and energy, a blade like a saber, not a saber, but a blade-like sort of grass plucked from a tuft of summer vegetation wielded by the hand like signals directing the movements of cranes and hoists, one more a journeyman. And though he killed your father, the printer, a manufacturer of scented pocket calendars and other printed matter before he was a soldier, we somehow ended up together. And in our home above the fire, we kept their portraits, two soldiers, two shy young men before they were fathers. My father was wounded in the Great War. He lost his face in a fierce battle, a flanking maneuver, a counterattack, a mission of forlorn hope. But which Great War? It was one of many great wars. One ordinary Titan War. And my father kept a glass cabinet of wax noses in his study and changed them several times a day. He had lost an eye in an offensive, a night operation, a minor skirmish, one of many small, loose parts. That now he had a glass eye. One eye was glass and the other was pewter, though the pewter eye had been his eye before the war, before the bayonet charge, the reckoning barrage. And these are among the things he carried. A steel jaw, a diamond tooth, a prosthetic limb, an arm to be precise, a hook for a hand. And he kept his eye, his tooth, a hook, a pair of pinking shears, and the rubberized semblance of a hand in a wooden case with small compartments, like a box of chocolates from the country where he had fought amid the dikes and earthworks during the land war, the one between the sea war and the sky war. And he had children too, besides me. There were children, legitimate children, and two or three false children. There were bastards, there were doppelgangers, there were changelings, there was a wax child and a glass child and a fire child, though that last was not a child at all, but merely a fire with which he lit his pipe. And he had a mandrake root, a mandragora, a suit of armor made of bone. And we who consisted yet of all our original parts were strangers to you, or so it seemed. You had a gun kept on the wall near the head of a deer bearing very large antlers. And we were there crouching down in the flower beds, watching you remove your flowered shirt. And we stood tall among the presences. Time, rain, water, chrysanthemum cultivated for fire, flying diamond cut by the lapidary winged strobe and bengal fire for the polity, triangular chrysanthemum, prismatic summer storm, jumbo saturn, flying gem, color bomb, and roman candle, airplanist, fly to sea world, spinning flash, mahatma, spin blue flax for fustian, 
peony friendship sails, lotus blossoms near constellation swan, a spinning flash, a cherry flash, Confucius, reckoning barrage, great sentinel fires seen from space, flying wheel, tricolor fountain placed upright on soft earth and ignited, biplane and dragonfly, sparrow and lacrosse, stone of red and gentle mightiness has its incessant day in the sun. The Oriole sings for its return. Let us look at one of those teardrops. In a typical post-war American house, in a, sorry, in a typical post-war American town in 1907, in a ranch style house on aluminum or oak street, on the wood paneled wall of a bedroom, Above the bedside table where a cigarette smolders in a crystal ashtray embossed with the logo of Zim's Cafe in orange lettering, there hangs a painting of a girl with huge round eyes. She is a child of perhaps 12. Her hair is straw yellow like corn to stuff a corn husk doll. Judging by her dress, she has spent the night in an ash heap. She is holding a terrified looking cat. She is standing in front of a blank wall of a building streaked with earth tones, and a single teardrop flows from each enormous eye, each teardrop big and glinting. Let us look at one of those teardrops. One day sailing, one executive on the deck of his small boat one summer, drinking his bottle of beer on open sea, was caught in a glittering mist blown in from the sea, it was some kind of mast from the sea that makes fathers vanish forever. It might have made him shrink like Gulliver to the size and texture of a spice, or a pink or emerald grain of sand, or turned him into a fish, or simply made him vanish. And so this executive was overcome by that mist and lost and gone forever by. On shore, a boy and girl were eating lunch out of an erstwhile violin case, papaya and oysters, agave and sea kelp for salt and sweetener. They have eloped together, having only just met. And now among the waves also follow no logic, preceded here in expectancy by sunlight on the ice plant, they break their long fast. How many cats grew up in your hometown? Who paid to feed them? Was the city green as a tree stump or blue as an atom summer nights? Was Melisande's convolvulus scattered in sunbeams? How's God? The girl lived in a phosphorescent dome with cement bay windows, strips of greenish paint curling in the salt air. Tall eucalyptus trees brushed the sky. The boy was abashed, having until late been killing time from age to age, cloud sculptor, glimmer of starlight rising with the rays of somerset one among people by the lakes of the sea and living on a ball of wire where the glassy vertical ships are set on blue gray pearl gray shading to deep purple blue gray and now let us say goodbye to them goodbye goodbye and our true penitent tears turn to solid pearl Hey, I'm going to read now some selections from a long, um, indeed, book-length poem that I'm working on now that I've been working on for the last few years. Um, and the first are a series of short passages, and then the last is a longer passage um, consisting of a few pages. Um, okay. First, childhood. Then, a growing confusion. Then, a period of waiting, of, prepara of preparation of wild hopes, a mixture of the real and the imagined. Unbearable patience is called for, like a core of glowing embers smoldering in the heart, the green panes of glass that the leaves spread over us and fuse together like the panels of a great translucent bell. We move from under the mulberries into the sun. We seem to have dissolved and become something else. We were entities at play, testing out the earth, playing parts, experimenting with betrayal and remorse, sleepless or tormented or transforming into nightingales. But now all things that once seemed strange 
are as close to you as Jupiter in autumn. And the hills are ringed with stars, not offering rest, but giving guidance toward a place that feels like everywhere. Is it possible that you can be yourself there? Total acceptance, if only for a moment. The leaves are violet and they are spiced with and lover and beloved ascend the slope on the night side of the, of the volcano. Drink summer's green and incandescent wine for green flames to gift all with sleep and obliteration. If they meet at earth's center or high above where the air thins or in the sleep of the living, day is a quintet. You'll see the lovers coming down a dark trail toward the town before the storm gathers on the mountain. They're slowly coming back to their senses, stunned and newly born like glass ferns that burst at the touch or like rain. They can't see each other in the dark, but they can feel. What is it to understand? Their kiss will be the kiss of rebellion because it is half in darkness, like the moon and its valleys, fails, and we can be as one or however many we wish to be. If morning and the rising sun make all things at least seem alive again, if not resurrect them, we can try at some point in its rising to stop, engage at what moment we seem least ourselves, not to be afraid and hateful, but to be filled with doubt as the resinous tree is full of golden sap. Because despite all, we love the earth. It reaches out to us, a green vine, plum branch, alien and gentle. It breaks vine, but it refuses to mean anything like a life which is too strange and beautiful to mean, it just is. There will be better dream books, better dreams, or we'll just let them be because we live them during the sweet short night or became bird people living off the grid, a cardinal or a simple blue jay because a pine cone or a seahorse or a galaxy are just themselves and nothing else. They can just be. We awoke at dawn in a city far to the north, in a tower of ice called the Sun Hotel. The tea oranges and a blur of blue leaves, ferns, the scent of sea ivy and viburnum. It is exhausting to always be something half finished, but we are here, half bird or half human and half something else undefined, and the visitor from the planet of youth looks on with a proud smile, like a marble queen, and returns to her private star, and her leaves brushes her cheek like a tear. This was always our desire. We wake like lost travelers, somehow finding ourselves on Earth. We hike down into the valley, we lie down in the cool grass, and we are rinsed in the haunted rain of summer until we attain an unspeakable brilliance. There is no deeper meaning. Yet we call Earth the revealer, though only part of us is known. We are in the midst of their flowering like blackberries. We sleep, but our hearts are awake. We were the children of wild cats and bear cats, gradually becoming human. The passage was hard. And on our way back down the mountain, there would be no time for cynicism, however justified. The green ferns and hanging vines glowing aloft, but more alive, furthest from what we think we should become, more with what could be. We are part of the metamorphosis. The dark is powerful. It is excellent to wait it out, but it is also excellent to set out like two dreams over darkening hills. And it is still there for you. It is true north, a gift for the wanderer, in the frozen wilderness door wreathed in fresh rhododendron, and inside bread and wine, on a table set for a banquet of one. It is just for you. You are the emissary. 
looked as little as you. My conscience was troubled and my fears all about me. In our parting over the darkening hills to a valley overspread with dented cities, strewn with scrapyards, but already I have forgotten half my quarrel. And a strange light rises over the fjord. It is merely Cygnus, the swan, friend to mariners. But to you, it is something. Else. It is like an echo of whatever was taking place inside you and forming only now the final surprise at last. Who wants to know how it's done? We all do, if you'd like to know. Saturn appears, and a second a moon, and a second moon appears over the glade. The mystery deepens. It is conjoining. It is a confluence of forces. Its name is written on a door. It is just coming into focus, in the sun rays falling through the meshes of what they mean, except by a kiss, which means nothing. We were all earthlings, bicker rejuvenating sun, or cooled in the darkness of the monstrous shadow as it passed. We were taking one pilgrimage after another, peregrine, though never quite lost. Home always seemed an earshot. The bell was calling us always as we neared. We just want to be what we are, but awake in the terrible cold of that awareness. In a strange zone where the glass leaves ring like bells, but shatter when we speak. So we are quiet for a while. But why does it seem impossible? Like a gate, a narrow gate wreathed in thorns. It seems beyond what we're able to feel. Like morning grapes frozen on the vine. But the wine somehow distills its golden drops. Always, summer departs. It goes over hills to the valley, and we go there to sleep in its cool, mysterious shade. Well, it's a passage from Emissaries. The truth is, one moment, please. The truth is, you are a listener, a secret listener. While be clouded and dark, the ball of crystal tells the time by clearing for just a moment. It's hidden from easy perception. Like piles of hay, they have moved out of reach of the destructive wind. It is just the beginning, as always. And as always, we search for it in divination. In divination by flight of birds, in divination by grass covering letters traced upon the ground, by winds, by a balanced hatchet, by arrows, by herb, north, to tell the future by the hand, by dice, by a balanced sieve, by a spirit seen in a magical lens, to tell it, to tell it by the laugh, by the position of the stars at birth, by dots made on at random, by walking in a circle, or by fish, by precious stones, by meteors, by letters forming your secret name, by dreams, by nails reflected in the sun rays, lit by fountains, by pebbles, by pebbles drawn from a heap, by ghosts and sacrificial fire, by the sea and the seashells, by passages in a book, or by departed spirits, by the departed spirits of those you loved. For it is you, it is for you that dawn breaks over the blue hills, with their terraced fields to nearly dreaming, where the raindrops grow more beautiful with your dawning awareness of the sounds they make. And like them, you are planning to disappear, to vanish completely, to lose identity irrevocably, and then be part of a great descent, just one tile in the mosaic. And there is no message on the mildewed wall. It is just how light falls on it, the green, the green rain light. Did you choose this place, this path, during these moments when you were half awake. And this splinaciously held to, even adopted as a code of living, and now the thunder is telepathic. It seems to read or feel your deepest thoughts and responds in the only way it can. And you receive its gift through the mind and the mind alone. You feel the cold freshness of the room in which this work, your work is done. There are no outside distractions. Heavy ticking of the grandfather clock covered in a layer of green moss is ticking. But the earth so near to man, so varied and manifold, but from her come the life-giving streams that wander the land. Deer is a storage of opals, flux grown like rubies. One gathers that a destination lies somewhere in the distance, past rank grass and cooling towers, mountains under red skies, and a flowering of curiosity flowers in you. And you can come as you are, ancient green stone, 
but it could be that what lies on the other side of that mountain is a group of emissaries sent to greet you. And they are bringing gifts. They are the possible people. The ones in a shadow life lived adjacent to yours, others on the margins. It is a delegation welcoming you. A guy once was walking down the street past Hennepin and Facet Avenue and stumbled over something. It was one of those big diamonds that people live, drop and just leave lying in the street. This was a big one, about the size of a very large cat or an anvil or an air conditioning unit for an apartment complex. So you just keep walking into the hills where it seems that all might be well if left the way you found it. And you could see your favorite star shining like a greeting. The science of observing winds aloft is important to aviation, but to the lapidary, his zircons near to hand, Rigel is very beautiful, and man and star are equally diligent. People are coming out of a building like streams of ants, but what are they doing? Ask the man who's in the insect business. He'll tell you. But you might need to sit on a tree stump and smoke a cigar with him as he tells you the story of how he fell in love. It's clear he's talking about a girl now not bugs. He claims he needs to start from the beginning, always a bad sign. So you leave him and walk from the enchanted wood into the town where some kind of procession is being planned. And who am I? The rains are falling now and a time of rest has come. Time has passed in feasting and enjoyment. Wine is brought out. One steps out into the courtyard to smoke a cigarette. Clouds still streak the sky and all seems just fine. Slowly the stars come out, one in their usual order. There are barely any lights on in the town, and in the surrounding hills and valleys, the night market has not opened yet. So the Milky Way can be seen, and it is wonderful. When he goes back inside, the men and women are pairing up and going off to bed. Damien and Irene, Orange and Ignacio, Sky and someone whose name means Diamond, Gia and the other girl named Gia, and then finally Dorothea and the girl no love or games, or whatever, or sleep, or whatever. You do you as they say, you only live once, say others, which is true, but what one does with that information is still to be seen. In the shadow pyramid sand on the outskirts of a shadow city, on a shadow planet, and its government does its dark work with a sullen diligence. We are traveling millions of our journey, and we are traveling at a leisurely pace, yet at great speeds thousands of miles per second. There is apprehension, but only mild fear. We are brave. Maybe the sun makes us brave, like it makes the great sycamore brave, but it breaks into an incandescent shower of sparks in the shadows of the golden hour. Has it been destroyed? Of course not. Has it shown of being something almost unknown to itself? Most likely. Whatever your feelings about it, the transformation must commence. Those with tormented minds or aloofness, sick with refusal and declining. A coalitionist, another a revanchist, one drags the seafloor for wrecks or giant crabs. Another haunts the creature call, hunts the creature called the rainbow jelly. Another collects golden resins from a tree that is nearly extinct. One is destroying an ancient wall while yet another is preparing maps for forecasting rains or adjusting the black bulb of the sunshine duration transmitter. Others are teaching the children the branches of knowledge given by the great teacher, cold and pure as alabaster. Knowledge of flute playing, of soil, the astringency of green persimmons, or of preparing sopper of erotics or remaining invisible, of recovering things lost by astrological means, and again, by the ways of divination, of arresting fire and water. It's been said that when she dwells up, but for all, she works slowly, teaches hard lessons, and it takes so long. And the comet is in the sky, and it's a wonderful thing for anyone, for everyone to see. All you need to do is look up. And still, if it is past, they can tell you all about it in their sleepy rhythms. These things that so often demand a hard telling. And since she is a messenger of love, we have come to call her Swan the Mighty, as she soars over mountains and seas to bring the message to all. She might live on sea coasts or near the waterfalls 
of inland regions or any stretch of land in sight of gravel crushers or the gantry cranes at evening. Her home, the true one, is a shadow planet. And what is a shadow planet? I want to tell you something that seems true, but in truth, I don't know yet. It is still to be seen. Okay. Thank you very much. Seem to come to, to come to an end. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey, for this opportunity to hear your reading tonight. And Thank I just you. want to remind our audience that they can drop their questions to the chat and I'll happily will read them. Okay, so there is, um, like, I didn't even have a chance to ask my questions, but here's a question from the audience. <laughs> Jeffrey, would you like to talk more about the secret listener? <laughs> um, just about what the secret listener is, I guess, is that sort of the question? I guess, I mean, I say you are a secret listener, so I'm not sure if the secret listener is maybe the person reading the poem or addressed, you know, the person addressed um, that I'm addressing in the poem. The secret listener is also the self, is a kind of secret listener. Um, the secret listener is sort of, I guess, uh, whatever that thing inside you that as the, the philosopher William James called the great companion, that kind of other part of you. Um, but I'm just kind of making this up as I go along. I'm not, <laughs> not exactly <laughs> sure. I'm, kind of, I, I'm in analyzing my own poem as I go here. When I wrote this, I wasn't exactly sure uh, what I meant by secret listener. Um, but as with so much when you're writing a poem, it just kind of seems right at the time. And then hopefully it kind of makes sense later. That's the hope. So I hope that somewhat answers the question, Zamira. Well, I, I think so. I don't know. It, it wasn't my question, but we, we hope so. Right, right, exactly. Okay. But since you know, you mentioned the great companion. Um, who is your great companion, and and what do you mean by that? I mean, like uh, you mentioned the other uh, philosopher, but what what is what does the great companion mean for you? Well, you know, I haven't read William James in quite a long time, and it would help me if I kind of remembered that. But I guess the thing I got from it, um, something struck me as as true when I read about. Um, uh, James talking about the great companion. And I think there's always, again, a part of us. I mean, I guess it, it's it's the part of us that, that we're always consulting when we're making ethical deliberations or when we're asking ourselves what is right, when we're asking ourselves about the future, and we're asking ourselves philosophical questions, and we're referring to this, this ideal thing in us that has the answers that very often doesn't, but uh, it seems like a somehow necessary uh, human thing. I'm not sure if that great companion is any better than um, than the lesser companion of the great companion, which is us, but still to be seen, I guess. I think, um, I'll ask a quick question about, um, you often, uh, in your poems, as, as we read them, as we heard them, uh, you often talk about the value or importance of becoming yourself, and what is your take on it? On becoming yourself, you said? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I... I mean, I, I, I guess we're always ourselves. And I think okay. maybe, right, obviously we're always ourselves, but we're also always kind of constantly trying on parts of different identities, which I think is a, is a, really, is a really necessary human thing. And I think we're all constantly in the process of building ourselves and soul making um, as, we, as we're constantly touching the world, as the interior world is constantly touching the exterior world, which is, I think, so much of what poetry is about, um, actually. Uh, but I think one of the things that, that we sort of, I mean, as, as I guess poets, we always, I feel we have to have a sense of, is that human beings are not any one thing, right? And this is something that's sort of in the, in the culture of kind of calling someone out on social media and sort of you know, ruining, ruining someone's lives for a misstep or you know, of immediately calling someone a hypocrite for some kind of moral lapse. I think we need to take under consideration the fact that we're all very complex and shifting, flexing, developing, um, uh, imperfect beings. We're constantly, whatever that self is, we are <laughs> becoming it, but maybe never quite it, and maybe also perfectly it, always simultaneously, so. Yeah. And, and while we are on the topic of becoming, um, how did you become a poet? And that would be my first question. And while we're still kind of like you mentioned that, you know, as we like leave, uh, we try different identities. What mm -hmm. were the identities that you tried and you realized that they are absolutely not you? 
what a question. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think I started, I fell in love with poetry when I started reading it and I loved the rhythms at a young age. In high school, um, when we read poetry in class, when we discussed poetry and analyzed it, I really was confused. I had no idea what people were talking about. <laughs> people were pulling these secret meanings out of it that I just didn't get. It seemed to me that the words just sounded good. The images were attractive to me. It just, I, the way I expressed it, it sounded cool, right? It sounded cool. Um, and then I discovered, like the first time I read the love, the American poet T.S. Eliot, The Love Song of Jail for Proof Rock, I didn't understand a word of it, but I knew that I was onto something important. I knew that I was reading something big and important and beautiful. Um, but anyway, so I sort of decided to become a poet. Um, and part of what, uh, well, yeah, I started writing poetry, let's say, and sort of exalted myself, you know, into this idea that someday maybe I'd become a poet, but it seemed like even too too great a thing to aspire to. Uh, but of course, as poets, I think we're constantly having to sort of try on identities. And for a poet, that's stealing from and borrowing from other poets, right? Seeing what other poets are doing and taking taking from one another. And I think often young poets are, are feel very nervous and self-conscious about this. We feel like we're, you know, we need to, ha need to have our own sort of identities, but we can't, we can't find that poetic identity without, without sharing and borrowing and communicating with others, I think. So I did a lot of that. I, hopefully I've found something of my own. <laughs> <laughs> one I mean of it feels so <laughs> and there is a question of, uh, i mean i'm going to like uh follow up with my question about the um identity that didn't fit later because like there is a question from the audience that kind of ties into the one you've just answered yeah. uh the person says i'd love to know if you find inspiration in wordsworth and which russian poets do you admire oh yeah wordsworth of course of course everyone has to know wordsworth right um, I've been reading, I've been looking through his long book length poem, The Prelude, recently, um, as I write my own long poem to get a sense of his his rhythms, his beautiful rhythms and how he does it. And of course, he's a, he's a great poet. He's kind of a poet's poet in a way and a great poet of soul making, soul building, identity searching. He, he writes an epic poem about the imagination. Um, and as for Oh gosh, as for Russian poets, you know, even recently I was reading, you're gonna have to help me with pronunciations, Amira Akhmatova. Akhmatova, that's right. Akhmatova. Okay, thank you. Almost there. <laughs> Almost there. And it's funny as I as I was writing the little poems I read, the, the passages of emissaries, I was kind of reminded, or I think I had her, some of her work sort of in my mind somewhere. Um, the way that she just beautifully beautifully presents an image and doesn't try to explain it. And so much emotion is in it. Um, and then if I had to name other Russian poets, they're there somewhere. And it's one of those situations where someone asks you to name someone and you just pull <laughs> it up from the files. So there we go. It'll come, I'll, I'll break into like, the conversation at some point and name another one. And, you know, anyway. Like when, you, when you say you love books and someone's like, so what's your favorite book? And you're like, oh, you're flustered by the question. <laughs> That's exactly it. Even, someone even got you a more difficult one. Who's your favorite Russian poet? So, you know, it's very specific, very up to the, you know. Yeah, that's specific. A pointed question. But let's go back to the identity that didn't fit. Like, you know, you, you became a poet. Like, you were like, I want to become a poet. And that identity, I don't know, but it feels like fits well. But what about those that didn't? What about, like, the parts of me that didn't? Or, yes, it's like, you know, you were testing identities and uh, some of them you were like, you know, this is absolutely not me. I, you know, I tried to, I've been teaching for many years, right? Um, but in a way, like for many years, I tried to sort of escape. I tried to, I tried to not do that. I did a bunch <laughs> of other things. I didn't want to admit that teaching was the thing that I should be doing. Um, I don't know why that was. So. I'm not sure if it had so much with trying on an identity as much as escaping an identity maybe for a certain number of years. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, although on the other hand, I never really, sometimes I think, oh, I wish I could have been, you know, something, you know, useful, a wind farm engineer or, you know, some, 
So there's <laughs> some very interesting thing that actually has sort of quantifiable results because being a poet is so strange. And as I think T.S. Eliot said, you never really will know if you wrecked your life for nothing, right? <laughs> Something like, did you waste for life for nothing? And yet, can't everyone say the same thing? Right? Um, can the, the the grower of orchids can can say the same thing? I suppose, or the baseball um, star as a you know whether what we did with our lives had meaning. Um, so yeah, that's that's a very curious thing because um, I actually read that you've been teaching uh, poetry writing to children and to adult um, writers or like poets um, and. That was interesting to me personally that, you know, this is a very, I, I used to be a teacher myself and I know that, you know, teaching kids and teaching adult um, learners is this completely different thing. But how do you, and, and you know, teaching poetry is an even more challenging thing. Uh, so how do your approaches to teaching poetry vary according to, you know, age of the writer or a setting? Well, like in a certain way, I guess, I want to help. How can I say this? Like, I feel like in a way, I need to sort of learn how to be a child when writing poetry. I don't mean that in a kitschy way. I don't think there's something like pure about children in the way that they make art, right? I don't think like, ah, oh, children are natural born artists. I mean, in a way they are, right? Because they're always sort of looking at things with new eyes and imagining. Um, but in order to, you know, in order to become the childlike painter that he was, Picasso had to, you know, as he said in that famous apocryphal story when someone asked him why he painted so sloppily or whatever with cubism, he said, yes, um, but I knew how to paint like uh, Leonardo when I was five years old, right? Or I knew how to paint like whatever it was. I knew how to paint like Michelangelo when I was five years old. So he had to go through kind of this, this process of becoming a child, um, of, of, of making art with the freshness and the new eyes that we sort of, that we sort of turn in our imaginations into like the way a child sees the world. Um, but you know, a child is just, is an unformed, right? Is sort of like a really natural artist. And you know, and we, 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 we kind of romanticize that, but a very unformed one. Um, so I think one of the things that, you know, I've tried to do with children is sort of, you know, focus the art in some kind of way, not, not, not deplete or limit freedom. Um, but, and I think with adults, you know, when I teach, adults like myself, I'm just sort of trying to do what I do with myself, which is inculcate or foster or teach uh, um, techniques towards freedom, becoming free. Because I, I think that poetry is the most, in certain ways, the most radical freedom. I call it radical freedom. I guess it was Hannah Arendt that, that used this, this phrase, radical freedom, I think. And I think poetry should be the thing that, you know, that, that is that is free, ultimately, the thing that is free, that uh, frees the imagination and is a kind of work of the soul and in, 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 in the personal realm, but also in the political realm, um, preparing ourselves for that, yeah. And I've gone far afield of your question, but there we go. <laughs> so, That's I mean, an amazing answer. To, thank you for, you know, such a detailed and, like, you know, open-ended answer in the same way thank you nice way. I mean, you know it's like there is there is room to for, for thinking as well so um there is i mean um you mentioned that you know teaching is a challenging thing for you but what is a what is a challenging thing uh for you when you you're writing when you like of, of being a poet for you the challenging thing about being a poet yeah um sitting down and writing is a challenge <laughs> i think for anyone and you know what People need to know that, like, well, I shouldn't reveal this, right? Um, because, it'll, but actually, sitting down and staring into space for long periods of time is a lot of, you know, the job of being a poet. Um, but like, sitting down is sort of is sort of necessary, um, uh, and that that's a hard thing. But then, you know, coming coming up with words from nothing, right? Coming just sort of, it's hard. It's hard writing poems. Um, so we're just we're just trying to, um, yeah, make ourselves make ourselves sit down. We don't, you know. Sometimes I wish that we, you know, like painters have it are lucky because, like, you know, painters, you know, you see these films of Jackson Pollock painting, and he's like running around the canvas, and he's like throwing, paint, and then he emerges, and he's got paint all over him, and he's smoking his cigarette. Like, obviously, he's been doing like this really hard work as an artist. Whereas a poet, it's like. <laughs> You just see us standing there and it's like, oh yes, I've been working very hard. <laughs> you know, there's, no, there's no evidence that I've been working hard, but it's been, you know, I've been working very hard. 
And, you know, so, I mean, in a way, it's, it's important for a poet, I think, to do nothing, right? I think a very important part of our job is to be comfortable doing nothing. And I think, you know, okay. being in a society that, that really sort of um, respects or rewards or, uh, you know, whatever privileges, vaunts, uh, uh, constant work and constant action, uh, I think that, you know, it, it needs to be resisted in a certain way. You know, I, I, I've been told that I work hard. I, <laughs> I don't think, I, I, I feel like I need to spend um, a lot of time doing nothing. And if I don't have that doing nothing time, I don't feel like I'm doing the work um, of a poet. So, uh -huh. so uh, I, I can, you know, um, what a draw from that. That sitting, sitting like for hours is not, doesn't come naturally to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's part of it. Like in a way, it doesn't. It doesn't, right? Um, once I do, once I can clear away like the space and actually and like, actually sit down, I guess I can do it forever. So. Okay, then, then then there is a next question that follows up, like, where does your inspiration come from? And once it's there, what's your process like? Yeah, so that that's a great question, but also one of those questions that, you know, when you ask a poet that question, I'm going to reveal something here um, that, we, that we, we sort of start making things up, right? We sort of start <laughs> making up answers that sound good. So let's see, <laughs> we become very practiced at, you know, making up things that kind of sound good because because um, we don't really know in a way, right? Like what kind of gets us going. But I would say it's, it's, it's very important. I mean, you know, the world around us is an incredibly strange, mysterious, vibrant, vexing, bizarre, alien thing in a way, right? Alien where like you these things, you know, forget it, people tell you you're part of the world, you're into, no, in a way we're sort of like alien visitors in this place. Um, and I and I find it strange and stunning and 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 beautiful being in this world, um, and that that's an inspiration to me. But also, of course, I have to read other poets, right? I have to always be reading um, other poets and always have an influx of, of language, of interesting, vibrant language coming. Because in reading other poets, you're what you're getting is is you're like dipping into the sense of someone's soul, like right? the flow of the soul. Not soul as a noun, but soul as a verb, right? You're dipping into this, the stream of the soul um, in the process of moving and changing and, and, and being at work. Yeah. I guess that's sort of, does that sound good? I mean, I, I loved it. Especially the part <laughs> okay. where the soul is a verb. All right, so I've made up a good one then, right? Okay. Yeah, we'll keep it. <laughs> okay, all right. And, and what are, uh, I mean, who are the poets you read for the, I mean, does it depend on the topic or does it depend, like, what does your choice of a poet for inspiration depend on? Uh, yeah, often, you know, I'll be reading one poet and they'll send me to another poet, like reading their poem, you know, it'll have the name of someone or a line or something that reminds me of another poet. And my library has become so sort of out of control in my small New York apartment that it's gotten to the point where I can often find that book that a poet sends me to. Um, so, uh, but I read, you know, I, I also feel I read whatever I'm kind of working on at the time. So right now, you know, I'm working on this very long poem. I've been working on this for several years and I'll turn to, you know, other writers of long poems and see how they're doing it. Someone like, Wordsworth or John Keats or John Ashbery or Edmund Spencer, right? Um, for for sort of to see to see how they're doing this thing and to you know again dip myself into this stream. A long poem is a very different thing. That that um, yeah. So yeah, that's amazing. I mean, <laughs> they, I mean now now the the listeners know like you know to 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 find the poets that fit their work. I mean, we do the same thing once we work, uh, when we work with certain things in, in our company. So, you know, it's always kind of interesting how people draw connections between different things. Yeah. But you mentioned one interesting thing. You said that, you, you know, um, that your book collection in your small New York apartment, and that kind of um, led me to another question. You, I, in your biography, um, I read that uh, you lived in, you were born in California, you work in Iowa, and you also live in New York. Mm -hmm. How do the spaces influence your style, your general kind of like um, attitude or kind of like um, your emotional state once you're in those spaces? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, you know, the question of how something influences you is one of those things where, again, it's sort of like there's no real quantifiable answer because you don't really know how something influences you, right? But but uh, that's not to avoid the question. Um, <laughs> I, know that, I know that living that living in New York, I've been here just this summer, I'm hitting the 30 year mark of being here. Um, and I know that being in an urban environment, I, I love being in an urban environment, but you know, despite its several aggravations, right? It is, it, it can be frustrating, but I love living in the city um, and the kind of noise and activity uh, uh, um, and buzz of the city and, and the different people in the buildings and, you know, things like, you know, I, I'm very inspired by museums. I go to museums a lot and architecture inspires me um, and things, things that, you know, just things that sort of offer, you know, visual things like, like buildings I really love because they don't really mean anything. I love something that doesn't mean anything and yet it's rich and appealing to the imagination and sort of gives the imagination room. Like it's not making any kind of statement. It's not, you know, there's no political statement there or whatever, but it's just leaving the mind area and space to roam. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure Iowa, you know, I lived there for a couple of years and went to graduate school. And then I went back there about 12 years ago to teach for, for part of a year. And that must, must be in there somewhere, must be in there somewhere. You know, I dream about these places, so dreams sort of come in. And, you know, when I travel, I love that because I always feel like when I travel, I travel to Europe this summer. A couple of summers ago, I traveled to the deserts in the American Southwest. And I'm always feeling while I'm there that I'm storing up dream material, um, things, things for dreams. I never quite feel, I don't know if I might share this with some poets, I never really feel like I've had an experience completely until the experience has been has become a poem like until i can until i sort of process that experience through writing in some way i'm not really sure it feels more real um poetry in certain ways is is the ultimate realness i feel um so when i'm having an experience there's there's a part of me that's that's just waiting to eventually uh process that material into into a poem i there's 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 a place in in the prelude where wordsworth is hiking through the alps and suddenly he like stops and says i'm in the alps and it's sort of like this moment where he sort of reminds himself or or is is thrilled with the discovery that he's actually in the moment in his body in this place um so yeah so the poetry somehow is the way for you to kind of like scream i'm in that place in a and kind of way. make it real yeah. that, that's yeah. very interesting i mean it, 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 it's certainly like it, life is an unfinished experience right it's always an unfinished experience um and you know death is the completion but death means nothing to us because we don't get to experience it right and we don't get to write about it and talk about it and think about it after it happens unless i mean possibly if we're people of faith or believe in something else but um But poetry does allow us to complete the experience of living in certain ways, to take an experience and consummate. The American philosopher John Dewey talks about how like a poem or work, a work of art is a consummated experience, like an experience brought to completion. And I like this idea. So yeah. Nice, that's very, it's a wonderful answer. Um, and then I'm just going to, okay. So I wanted to remind the audience that we have very little time left so they can, you know, Uh, throw the questions into the chat. Um, uh -huh. There is actually a question from the audience. Does your long poem have a consistent structure? For example, free verse or something like that? I would say free verse that occasionally goes into syllabic verse or kind of the five beat line, which is the most common line of English verse. So I'll go for long sections. Um, occasionally I go into a section that's a series of haiku. Um, though not strictly syllabic haiku, but I, I, I do mostly go by uh, rhythms. I feel like I'm going at like a pretty, a pretty consistent rhythm throughout. The most important thing for me for a poem is to, for it to, be, to really move. It needs to really, really um, have a propulsive force and feel alive. And if it doesn't do that, uh, um, then I have a problem. <laughs> that's, that's the best, yeah. That's wonderful. You know, the, 
the poem should have its own energy. Yeah. Um, and there is a question for me then. Uh, what advice would you give to aspiring poets? Because I know that uh, many people of our audience are aspiring poets or are currently writing. Um, mm. What would be your advice? Oh yeah, to um, read as much poetry as you can. I mean, it, 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 from our Russian audience, there is such an amazing, of course, I don't have to tell anyone, such an amazing poetic tradition in Russian. Um, lucky to have that. Um, and read lots of poetry in translation. So just, it's very important to read as much poetry as you can. Um, and, you know, don't, if you're an aspiring poet, don't be in too much of a hurry to publish. I mean, it's so easy to publish now with social media and everything, but uh, you know, you have plenty of time. Don't worry about, the, you know, one of my closest, closest friends, dear, dear friend of mine who died two years ago from COVID. He was, he was quite elderly, actually. He didn't publish his first book till he was 62, 63. Um, and it's, it, his work is fantastic, but people publish at different rates. I would just say, you know, don't have to wait until you're in your 60s, <laughs> but um, you know, just take your time, uh, you know, right before you publish, but read and write a lot. How do you know that the poem is ready or you are ready to publish? Like, is there yeah. some certain kind of like guideline or a sign or a feeling that you should kind of have? Show it to a friend or show it to an editor. Those are sometimes <laughs> the same person, if you're lucky. But okay. of course, like, of course, some pe it's very different for different people. Some people work on a poem forever. Um, um, I, I, I'm not exactly sure when something is finished. It's finished, I guess, when it's published ultimately, right? When you ultimately say it's finished and you don't really know. How do you, how do you personally know that it's, you know, the, the time to let the poem go? I mean, like in, into the publishing world or into the trash bin, you know, sometimes. Yeah, I, I'll, and I, I get rid of a lot of poems, um, and pretty much when I'm ready, I don't do a lot of the heavy editing because writing is much more exciting to me than editing, of course. I think <laughs> so I don't really start the real involved heavy editing process until I'm ready to put the book together. Like I say to myself, I'm gonna send this book to my wonderful editor soon. So now I'm gonna sit down and put this together. And then I go through that, that process of editing very carefully. Um, and then I have someone going, where's your book? you know, pass it along soon. And then that external pressure, which so many of us writers need is exerted. And then I can sort of force things <laughs> ultimately. That's wonderful. I guess it cycle back to, you know, difficulty of sitting down. <laughs> Editing comes next. Sure. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yep. And, and then I'll have the last question for today. Um, and since, you know, you work with New York University and there is the community of poets there, of contemporary poets, and I saw that Ocean Wong, I think, joined your faculty this year, um, if I'm not mistaken. Who are the contemporary poets or writers whose work you admire and you kind of recommend to look up to or kind of follow? Yeah, um, there, there are many writers who I, poets writing now, who I really love. Um, and, you know, oftentimes they're your friends and, you know, that's because you admire the work of a poet, you become their friend or your fr their friend and thus you're more open um, uh, to, to reading and understanding and living with their work. Um, you know, some, a, a, per, a person who, I mean, there's, there's poets I love, a poet like Anthony Madrid, who might be watching now, whose work I've been reading lately, who came out with a book recently that I'm very excited about. Um, it, it, my, my friend Reagan Good, wonderful poet. Um, there are, and, and, you know, I'm gonna forget to mention so many, but, uh, but yeah, there's so much exciting going on in American poetry right now. My friend Matthew Rohr, he's a great poet. There are many, many others. Yeah, uh, Chris Murray, who might be watching now. Um, yeah. <laughs> there are so many poets watching us. And now I feel like, you know, a little bit stressed. <laughs> <laughs> I see all the poets there. Uh, yeah. And I think, um, guys, if you have any more questions, that's your last chance. I mean, uh, Jeffrey's still around. I guess we can send him the questions later, too. But um, you have the last chance to send um, any questions that you have. Um, and then, you know, then my question would be, um, do you ever tell your poet friends or writer's friends that you don't like their work? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, 
Probably not, because I think most of my friends, I like their, I love their work. I mean, again, like when you're friends with someone, you become, you become very sympathetic to their work. But also the exciting thing is when you love their work so much that you have jealousy and you're angry with them for writing such great stuff because you're like, I want to write something that good. There's a great kind of very healthy, fruitful, professional kind of um, poet to poet uh, jealousy that goes on that I think is that's, that's, that, that, that's very good for your work. A friend of mine will give me a poet. Like, I want to write something that beautiful too, um, and then you go to and then you go to work. That's that's nice. You know, another feeling of inspiration coming from. Yeah. All right, thank you, Jeffrey, for this opportunity to host you tonight, and the American Center in Moscow for organizing the event. And thanks to our great audience. And please fill out the service that can make our events even better. Thank and you so much, Zamira. Thank you so so much. It was so nice talking to you and everyone. And thanks to the American Center in Moscow also. Sure. Uh, till we meet again. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye.